It's really a matter of pure protocol. You know, just sort of went out there to be polite. But really polite to say, you know, I was the new guy in town who was teaching folklore classes and tell him that I liked his books. And the thing, the first thing that really impressed me about him was that he was bored with it too. You know, he, he didn't want to, he didn't want to have somebody coming out there just to be polite to him, and, and I could tell that right away. And the thing I identified uh, with him really wasn't a, a kind of shared Ozark background, because my people come from West Virginia. Uh, <laughs> but what it was was a shared sort of romantic attachment to outlaws. Uh, and as I've worked now for the last three years uh, with him, pretty, pretty, uh, almost on a weekly basis, I started visiting him, so that by the time he died, I suspect that probably Gordon McCann and I have more tapes of him than anybody else in the world. I'm a, I think I have about 85 to 90 hours of tape uh, talking with fans. Um, and the thing that, that intrigued me about him, I'm using outlaw in the largest sense, although in the most restricted sense, he also identified with outlaws. Uh, Gordon mentioned to you that his acquaintance with the Short family. The Short family was, was quite prominent around Galena, Missouri, and probably most people uh, know the family through Dewey Short, who was a, a U.S. congressman. But Vance's own personal favorite among the Short family was Leonard Short, to whom uh, the most recent publication, Vance Randolph and the Ozarks, that's put out by the Ozark Mountain Press, was dedicated, in fact, it's, it's, it's to the memory of Leonard Short. Well, Leonard Short was not a U.S. congressman at all. Leonard Short was a bank robber. Uh, in fact, he, he died uh, escaping from uh, the custody of the law enforcement officials in Oklahoma. So the uh, Vance's identification with outlaws is, is true in the most narrow sense, but also true in the widest sense. I think the first thing you want to say about Vance Randolph to understand him as a personality was that he was a maverick, that the, the isolation that Gordon referred to that characterized his, his uh, last years was actually a characteristic of most of his life. And that if you name the, the kind of traditions that he participated in, I just jotted down a few of them, they tend to be, in the larger sense of the, the word, outlaw traditions, or at least not mainstream traditions. That Vance loved to tell the stories that he told both of us about his opposition by Chamber of Commerce types in Springfield. Uh, the, uh, they thought that he was bad for, you know, bad for the image of the Ozarks because he was writing about what were termed low-life ridge runners and things like that. Uh, I actually have in my files a letter that Vance gave me that threatening to tar and feather him, uh, written in the 1930s by a man who did not sign his name but signed himself Ozark Booster. Um, <laughs> they said, you better be kinder to us in the next book you write, or me and some boys are going to come over there and tar and feather you and ride you out of town. I mean, was, this was quite common. He was also threatened once, as he put it, by an elderly gentleman in a, in a, ho in a hotel in Joplin. Uh, so that well, his whole life was characterized by, by a sense of himself as being some distance from the respectable mainstream. And I've listed four or five of the great traditions which, in my biography, I'm going to call outlaw traditions, even though you know, they're not outlaws in the limited sense that men with badges are looking for them. Uh, the first one is the political tradition. The, Politically, Vance Randolph, uh, up through the 1920s, uh, at about which time he became politically, you know, just unconcerned. I have lots of tapes telling me that he just sort of gave up interest in politics at the end of the 1920s. But before that, he was a socialist, uh, quite clearly. He was a card-carrying member of the Socialist Party. Uh, came within an eyelash once of being run, being uh, nominated on the socialist ticket to, for the school board in Pittsburgh, Kansas, where he was. He was teaching biology in the high school. Uh, he was very, to his last days, I have some great tapes of him singing wobbly songs. I don't know whether you have any tapes of him singing IWW songs, but even in his 80s, he loved to quaver out conditions they are bad. And, and I have some, some of the most moving tapes I have of him are his discussions of conditions in the mines around Pittsburgh, Kansas. Uh, he identified with the miners and against what he tended to call the goddamn operators, uh, the people who owned the mines. And he was, he was a political radical, which removed him right away from the mainstream. And that was a choice which actually went against his birth, because his father, I mean, you can almost spatialize it. It's, you, know, you just draw a circle, and you put his birth at the center. I mean, he was born into an, you know, 
a uh, Episcopalian Republican family. His father was the city attorney of Pittsburgh. But Pittsburgh as a town is a kind of wasp stronghold surrounded by uh, ethnic mining camps, Frontenac and, and uh, other towns like this uh, that were around Pittsburgh that were populated largely by immigrant miners. Randolph identified very early with the, with the periphery against the center. That's a, if there were one image that I would give you of Randolph, that would be it. That he identified with the edge in opposition to the center, even though he was basically born to the center. So the first one would be political. The second outlaw tradition, I suppose, would be occupational. All his life, I listed about five or six different occupational uh, uh, outlaw traditions. He liked to hang around with gamblers and moonshiners. I've already mentioned uh, bank robbers. Uh, there was a period in, right around 1920, 1919 and early 1920, when he gave himself over almost completely to hoboing. Uh, was very proud all, of, all his life of his mastery of, of various jargons of the underworld. Uh, used to come, I'd come out there and he'd say, you know what a mush faker is, Cochran? I mean, and he would tell me all the, a mush faker was a person who used to steal umbrellas to, uh, was apparently going to fix them. And some poor scholar had, had misinterpreted that term in print, uh, had gone into print with a wrong definition of that term, and Randolph jumped all over him with glee. Uh, Randolph was proud all his life of knowing the jargon of hobos, of knowing the, the lingo of, of various sort of tramp professions. One of the most interesting documents I have is a diary he kept of a tramp, of a, about a month and a half tramping journey through Florida that he took in December of 1919 and January of 1920. Um, now, a couple more important occupational ones. Artists. I know that, see, that's why I say I'm using outlaw in the most... Uh, most general sense. Uh, we don't really think of artists as outlaws, but uh, you know they're they're a marginal profession. And Randolph, quite early on, wanted to make a living as a writer, and tried for some time to to make a living as a as a writer of short stories. He, he specialized in realistic short fiction. He submitted stories to magazines. He didn't have much success with this, um, but at least for a long time he was he was he aspired to be a writer. And of course he did end up as a writer, but primarily as a, as a journalistic writer. Uh, but he identified with, with this tradition as well. And then the last great one, this will be even more surprising as an outlaw tradition, is scholars. Um, I, I think it's, it's quite defensible to see scholars as an outlaw tradition, and, and certainly Randolph did see them that way. Uh, he wrote little histories of philosophy for Haldeman Julius's little blue book operation. And if you read those, one of the things you note is that Randolph keeps portraying all the scholars being run out of town. Uh, it's, the, it's the classic Socrates story, you know, the, the, the scholar tends not to find much honor in his hometown. In fact, his citizen, the citizens tend to put him on trial and string him up. And so what, uh, what Rand when Randolph presents someone like Spinoza, for example, you know, a major figure in the philosophic tradition, what Randolph focuses on is the fact that Spinoza was kicked out of the synagogue, uh, was run out of Amsterdam, and generally did not find a lot of favor with his neighbors. Uh, and Randolph's perspective tended to tended to, to see things in that way. The, again, the center and the periphery, and the scholar, by the choice by his choice of profession, marginalized himself in Randolph's eyes. And I think that so you've got all these different occupational groups that are that he sees as outlaws. Probably the greatest single heroes of his life, if I had to name two from the time I spent with him, one, the first one would clearly be George Borrow. George Borrow's not a major name to you know, a household word in the United States, but George Borrow was an Englishman uh, who was famous in his own day for his books about gypsies, primarily. Uh, and his entire life, Randolph was an enthusiast, enthusiastic Borovian. Uh, my experiences during Vance's last days in the hospital that, that uh, Gordon referred to was that when I would go out to visit him in those last days of October last year, the book the one book that he asked me to bring to him were, were Romany Rye and Lavengro. And the last things I read to him when he couldn't you know, read for himself at all were excerpts from George Borrow's books. Uh, the easiest tag for people who are not familiar with Borrow, as I wasn't, I, I, I discovered Borrow basically as, as something more than a footnote uh, through Randolph, who loaned me you know, his uh, copy of, of Knapp's biography of Borrow. Uh, Borrow was basically a, 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 
romantic in his approach toward so-called primitive groups, and, and he loved to, to write about gypsies, and certainly his, his identification with gypsies would be describable as romantic. Randolph read everything he could get a hold of on gypsies, uh, so that he, when he came to the Ozarks, part of his identification with Ozarkers was that they were, uh, to some degree, like all these other groups I've named, outsiders. They were outside of the mainstream of uh, American civilization as he understood it, as he used to describe them, and the term was complimentary. In book after book, Randolph described Ozarkers as the most deliberately unprogressive people in America. Uh, that, that phrase just appears in introduction after introduction in his books. So that when you try to understand Randolph's affection for and his commitment to the traditional uh, Ozarkers, uh, I think you have to see it in those terms. You have to see him identifying that with them as like scholars, like socialists, and, and other, other groups of this kind that I've been trying to list for you that as, as outsider marginal groups. So that the way that, that both Gordon and I met Vance in, a, in the old folks' home at Sunrise Manor uh, as, a, as a kind of isolated figure uh, was really the way he spent most of his life. Now, that doesn't mean that he was an absolute loner that he had no close friendships, because in fact he did. And uh, his marriage with Mary Parler, when he married her when he was 70 years old, could only be seen as a, as a striking success. Um, that as depressing as Sunrise Manor was in many ways, uh, the room that Vance and Mary was in was in some ways a harbor in a storm out there. The, the two of them obviously sustained each other, and it surprised no one that after Vance's death that, that Mary died fairly soon thereafter. Uh, the two of them together were, you know, a kind of island in that place. And, and I would, so I, I used to see my own visits to that place as someone sort of fighting his way through the place, as, as Gordon described it, to get to their room, uh, which was uh, a particularly good place. And I, I uh, enjoyed going out there, you know, as I say, virtually weekly for three years. But the, the initial, my, identi my initial identification and my initial interest you know, was when I sensed. Uh, his, his great liking for these marginal traditions. You know, I mentioned Barrow as one of his great heroes. The second one is one of my great heroes, Eugene Debs. Uh, he loved to tell stories about <laughs> Eugene Debs. Uh, most of you may not know a whole lot about Eugene Debs, but Debs was, a, he's, he's probably better known than Barrow. Debs was a, probably the most famous uh, candidate of the, of the Socialist Party in this country. Uh, a wonderful man in my own in my own mind, and when I found that Vance greatly greatly uh, revered him as well, and could tell stories. I mean, in his 80s, Vance could closely paraphrase Debs' speeches, um, and could tell me stories about Debs being in the Atlanta penitentiary for for uh, objecting, you know, for refusal to participate in or refusal to approve of American entry into World War One, when uh, he was pardoned, when when Harding finally pardoned Debs. Debs came out of prison and said, you know, utterly unrepentant, and said, it's, the, it's wrong for the government to be pardoning me. They should be asking me to pardon them. Um, and Randolph loved to tell that story. Uh, he, he thought Debs was a terrific uh, model, and in fact had known Debs when he worked on the Appeal to Reason, a socialist newspaper in Girard, Kansas. Randolph worked for some three months as an editorial writer on it, and one of his proudest lines was, Gene Debs called me by my first name. Uh, and that just hooked me. I mean, when I when I found out that, that one of my great heroes was also one of Randolph's great heroes, uh, and that he had this kind of romantic, you know, romantic is a pejorative word, and as a biographer, I'm going to have to deal with that. It's it's unscientific, you know, for a for a folklorist to be sort of identifying with his uh, his subjects in that way. And there's probably a, some danger in Randolph's objectivity and the degree to which he to which he celebrated the lives of the people he was. You know, documenting. Uh, I don't know whether any of you know the films of, of a filmmaker named Les Blank today, but it's, it's, it's the same kind of unabashed uh, celebration in some ways, which, you know, for for a long time was, was sort of very suspect and may still be <coughs> suspect in the academy. But uh, Randolph was outside the academy and he he reveled in that. Herbert Halpert, who Gordon mentioned to, was for a long time about the only major academic who who said, much, uh, said very many good things about him. Herbert Halpert was his great champion inside the academy for many years. 
I should add, though, in, fa in fairness to the Academy, that the rejection of Randolph by the Academy <laughs> has been has been greatly overstated. Uh, you go and look and see the things that the Academy said about Randolph. They tend to be, for the most part, pretty complimentary. Um, I guess the worst thing that can be said about the Academy is it took him a long time to start saying anything at all. Uh, his first two major books, his Ozark ethnographies that came out in the early 30s, uh, were virtually ignored by the academic press. And it wasn't until Ozark folk songs came out. And the first volume came out in 1946, and then the year after that, 1947, Columbia issued Ozark uh, Superstitions. Those books were what started to get academic recognition for violence. But my experience is, is very, very similar to Gordon's, basically. Even though uh, I didn't know Vance until 1976, uh, I never saw him outside a bed or a wheelchair. And so I, I'm extraordinarily fortunate as his biographer that he is more than a phantom of print to me, that I did have three years of seeing him, seeing him weekly. But nonetheless, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm always conscious when I, when I correspond with someone like Herbert Halpert, who's doing much earlier, or talk to people as I have. I've gone around and interviewed people who knew Vance you know, years and years before I ever met him. I'm, I'm really conscious all the time, in fact, almost embarrassingly, of the intimacy which I could never attain with, a, with this man on a, on a personal basis. I mean, after all, we were more than 50 years separate us in age. So, you know, it's been, a, it's been a, it's easily been the most complex and demanding thing I've ever attempted. Uh, I certainly share Gordon's notion that he's the most compelling personality that I've ever dealt with. Uh, I hope to finish this book by January. Uh, um, you know, I've been working on it for three years, and I think that had I known how large a task it was when I undertook it, I might have been daunted. I might not have ever done it. I, the idea of willingly giving up three years of my own life to studying somebody else's is not something that I had ever considered before. Mm -hmm. I must admit that I entered it in ignorance, saying, well, I'll dash this baby off, you know, and it'll get myself promoted to full professor and, and uh, live happily ever after. Uh, three years later, I'm still in the wilds, and, and uh, I've collected hundreds of letters that the man wrote, uh, and I really can't say I've regretted it, but it, it really was a surprise to me, and it has swallowed me up. He, is a, he was, he was a, and is today, through, through print to me, an absolutely compelling personality. It just, uh, Gordon and I both are, I'm sure, we share this kind of frustration to <coughs> convey a sense of the, the man's magnitude that we've just been talking about. I especially enjoyed hearing the tapes. I mean, I spend a good bit of my waking hours now transcribing tapes. Uh, but Because I'm the only one that can do it. If you found that to be true, wow. that no one can really understand Vance's speech. He, he had a bad stuttering problem as a young man. He, he always refused to deal with the telephone. And so that his speech was never, even as a younger man, at the, at the clearest. But uh, so you know, I can't hire anyone to do these tapes. And, and really, it's Mike Luster or myself, the, the fellow that I worked on this bibliography, with, that do the tapes. Um, I suppose that's long enough. I, I didn't bring a watch. I suppose I've talked for 20, 25, 30 minutes. Does anybody have any questions that, that you know, are obvious omissions from the things I talked about? Yeah, I'd like to make a quick note to uh, one of the remarks. Uh, first one, uh, two footnotes. First one, uh, when I met him in 71, introduced by Max Hunter, he uh, jumped up after when he heard that I was a professor of German, and he started bellowing out a German beer drinking song. And uh, I had been warned of, since we were traveling with three ladies, that he would be we should be careful because he might use <coughs> obscene language. The only obscene word he used was he told of losing his student drinking book, student uh, song book that he had used uh, as a young fellow in St. Louis. And he said, that son of a bitch stole it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That yeah. was the only obscene word he used. The yeah. other one is the first recording that we heard. Uh, since you mentioned, Bob, that he was a romantic, it uh, seems to me it's interesting that I recall that that was printed by a German romanticist, sometimes judged a German romanticist, uh, Heinrich von Kleist, who, who died in 1811. And uh, the it was in a group of anecdotes that he tells as anecdotes happening during the Seven Years' War, the, just to show that this setting is a European background there, possibly German, and uh, it's told on a uh, French 
soldier in Germany rather than in Oklahoma. <laughs> yeah. Well, he was always very proud of that, of his days in St. Louis, too. I mean, his days in St. Louis is when he knew another great socialist heroine, Emma Goldman. Uh, he didn't know her very well. He used to make fun of his tendency to exaggerate his, his uh, friendship with the great. But yeah, they, their story, everybody who's ever talked to him has seen him burst into song at one time or another. I, I tended to get the IWW songs because he knew that I liked that. Yeah. Well, I've been interested to see that we both We've never heard each other speak ever on this subject. We just usually passed in the hall or something, but we've made a lot of the same observations. Oh, yeah. that, uh, yeah, I, it was, I knew when I drove over here. I just said, well, I'm, I'm not going to prepare anything until I get here, and I'll just listen to Gordon. And it'll, <laughs> it'll, uh, I'm, it'll, I'm sure it will tell me what to, you know, what sort of things to, to do thematically because, you know, I think the salient aspects of his personality are pretty prominent. And one thing that amazed me, we'd sit there when I first knew him, and he'd start talking about, well, you should look back at so-and-so's book written in 1922, and if you look in chapter so-and-so, page so-and-so, and I thought, well, where's he got this file? And I did. I thought somebody was bringing material, and it didn't take me long to realize that he had almost total recall. Yeah. He had a tremendous mind. He oh, just, when I was listening to you, I mean, one of the first things he did with me was tell me where you were getting the brown meal tobacco. So he had lots of people <laughs> buying brown meal tobacco, you know, and, and gosh, I mean, he was able to tell me what stores to yeah. get. You know, I was new in Fayetteville. Well, when my boy reached 21, it tickled him to death because he said he had somebody else to get him scotch. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Gordon's boy was in my folklore. That's class, right, he was. So, I mean, the, the circle is unbroken. Yeah, Bill Vance, I think, himself said this, that he was the only non-PhD who ever taught American book books like that. That is the truth. <laughs> uh, first fellow, George Bush. No, we're not hearing you. Okay, I can just repeat what he said. There's, yeah. a, there's a small there's a factual error in that Vance is not the only non-PhD to be a fellow of the, arts, of the American Folklore Society. The first one was George Corson, who also did not have a PhD. Yeah, he was a uh, Pennsylvania who did a lot of work with miners too. Is there somebody back here? I was just going to say that when I came to Fayetteville in 1960, I met Mary <coughs> and Vance at that time. And one of the uh, interesting incompatibilities between Vance and Mary C. is that Vance loves scotch, and I knew that and always took that to him at the at Sunrise Manor. But Mary C. was a bourbon drinker in those days. <laughs> so and I would buy the case of bourbon down at the Hot Knob, you know, and take it over there. I don't know how they managed to overcome that, but when they got married, Mary C. told me, says, yeah, we had to get married because we had to give the baby a name. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they love to joke about that. I have lots of, you know, the, I, they're directly contradictory stories on that, though, because I wanted to know why, I mean, it was a conspicuous thing, man of 70, you know, gets married. Um, and so both of them told absolutely contradictory stories. Uh, Vance said, I begged her to marry me, you know. Uh, Mary said, I begged him to marry me. I set my cap for him the day I saw him. You know, they, they, they really played with that a lot. But Mary C. said that the, no, Vance told me that the way they finally proposed and agreed to marry was uh, Vance looked to their ass. This was after he broke his hip uh, the second time, I guess. And he said, Mary, hell, we can't be any worse off together <laughs> than we are separate. And she was beginning to go blind at that time. Yeah. I was curious about his uh, leaving the political uh, world altogether. He, did, did he have any story that he <laughs> repeat, explain why he came to this movement? Yeah, actually he did, because I was very curious about that, because one of that, as I say, that was why I got interested, you know, more interested in him as a personality. Uh, you can almost date it, I mean, the early 20s, after World War I, he said, and this is clearly true historically, he said that the Socialist Party didn't amount to anything that uh, so that you know to be a socialist after 1920 was to be a joke um, and he didn't he didn't care for that um, he did vote he voted for Roosevelt and I have about a 20 minute he, he voted for, yeah pardon me? He, he voted for Roosevelt um, and, you know three or four times but after that he never 